OK. My friends, uh, even the best things have to come to an end, and so does this Poincaré celebration. And we are approaching the start of the final speech in this conference. For to go well with the celebration of legendary Henri Poincaré, we have here a legendary speaker, Percy Diaconis, from Stanford, known, of course, for his uh, great abilities of uh, great mathematician and also for his great ability of magician in a past life that maybe is not so, not so past. <laughs> so Percy will tell us about Poincaré and probability theory. Thank you. Thank you. The, this is a no free lunch theorem, Cedric. And uh, your job <laughs> is to make sure that everybody gets one of these pieces of paper. There's a one page handout. So. Is it some kind of revenge or something? <laughs> <laughs> As a good director, he knows how to handle these problems. So good, <laughs> good early evening. Uh, uh, the, what I want to tell you about uh, today is, is two things. Um, the, the, the first is I want to try to bring to life for you uh, some of what Poincaré did uh, when he did probability. And the second point I want to make, and I'll try to make it, is that um, it's still very much worthwhile reading Poincaré there are treasures there. There are open problems. There are all kinds of interesting ideas. And I'll try to make that um, uh, specific. Uh, don't expect too much in the following sense. Uh, Poincaré didn't have probability as his main activity. Uh, he got interested in the subject when he had to start teaching at the Sorbonne. And uh, he, he eventually gave a course in probability that became notes, that became, a, uh, that became a textbook in 1896. Uh, and um, then, uh, so, uh, and then he published a second edition of the book in, uh, in 1912, the year that he, he died. And uh, uh, so what we have to work from is not a collection of papers or, or, uh, or a big body of work, but this, this textbook that he, that he wrote. And I'm going to talk about um, three topics that, that are in the book that are topics that I've worked on also. Uh, and the first is roulette. Uh, and the, uh, I think it's useful to begin with a discussion of real roulette. <laughs> Soon we'll be doing math, and OK. Uh, but there's also real roulette. Remember that? Uh, real roulette, there's a, a big wheel. And uh, there's a ball that goes ping around the outer wheel. And then there's an inner wheel, which is spun, that goes the opposite way. And uh, the ball eventually falls off the outer wheel, lands in the inner wheel, and it lands on a number. And there's a table, and you can bet. Well, from that description, and as you all know, roulette is a physical game. It, it's, uh, it, there's a real object there. And uh, when I was a beginning assistant professor in, uh, at, at Stanford, three of us realized you know, roulette is a physical game. Uh, we could clock it. <laughs> and so what we did was make a little gadget, which was about the size of this gadget, <laughs> the gadget that is connected to my pocket. <laughs> here, here, eventually, it'll come out. It was about, about this size. And, um, and so we would be in the casino, and, um, and the dealer deals the ball around. And when the ball comes around a fixed point in the room, you push a button. And when the ball comes around again, you tap again. And now the gadget knows how fast the ball is going. And when zero on the inner wheel passes a corner, you tap. 
and then tap again when it comes around. And the gadget knows how fast the inner wheel is turning. And then the gadget does a calculation, and, uh, and it tells you where the ball will land. It's only accurate to within half a wheel. <laughs> but if you're getting 35 to 1 on an 18 to 1 shot, that's like having a vacuum cleaner in the casino. Okay. And um, we, we built such a gadget and went and used it and made money. Uh, you know, it's just thinking, right? We didn't touch anything. Uh, now, along the way, just to put a few sentences of reality in, uh, the first thing we did, of course, is do the equations. Kind of interesting uh, uh, math to do the equations. And then I went and rented a roulette wheel, and we tried it out. And, uh, and it, all of our equations were completely wrong. Uh, and we realized that, as you usually have to, we left friction out in a reasonably serious way. And there are three kinds of friction that mattered here. There's sliding friction, rolling friction, and air friction. And the type that really mattered was air friction, so that when they turned on the air conditioners in the casino, all the equations changed. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't useless to have done the math. Uh, in fact, um, the form of the equations, we could just leave in their form with some parameters and go into the casino and tune them up and plug in, estimate the parameters based on 20 or 30 spins of the wheel and get, get quite accurate uh, uh, assessments of the, of, of the wheel. And so there is a world of, of real roulette, and it's a physical game, is one thought uh, for, for you. So why on earth is roulette random? That's a question. I mean, what, what's random about roulette? And Poincaré uh, dealt with that question uh, in, in, uh, in a, a chapter of his, his book. And, and he phrased it this way, as we all do. He made a toy model. Um, and uh, he said, uh, suppose that when the ball is spun, it, it spins around, and, um, and it, 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 it comes to land with a certain probability distribution. So let f of, I'll call it theta, uh, be the, the, the probability that the ball lands at theta. And so we've taken the roulette wheel and opened it out. That's OK. This is 0. This is 2 pi. And f is some function. And of course, if, you're, if the dealer is very accurate, maybe f is very peak. But anyway, this is f. And Poincaré talked about the probability of red, and so well, you can think about the, around the wheel, the reds and blacks alternate. And so he took a serration uh, where this is of small radius h. And, um, and he reasoned that the, uh, the chance of red is the area under the curve over the red squares. And so this is some propensity for the ball to land. Now notice this is simplified an awful, awful lot. There are not two wheels anymore, and there's no bouncing. This is the chance that the ball lands at theta. But still, um, uh, those are the assumptions he made. And then he proves, and we will too, that uh, uh, the probability uh, of red uh, if h is small, uh, tends to a half uh, as h goes to 0, which, OK, makes, of course, makes intuitive sense. But this is a theorem of, of Poincaré's from his probability book. And let me give you a version of his argument. Um, he said, look, uh, we may as well just look at uh, the probability sub h of red minus the probability uh, sub h of black. 
And that's the difference between the area under the red squares minus the difference under the black squares. And so that's less than or equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of uh, f of theta minus f of theta plus h um, d theta. So that the, the difference between the two areas can be bounded by taking the absolute value inside. And then Poincaré well, says that uh, this is less than or equal to what I'll call omega sub f of h, um, where uh, omega sub f of, of h is the modulus of continuity. Uh, it's the maximum uh, over um, uh, differences less than or equal to h of f of x minus f of y. This is how wiggly the function is. And he knew that for um, continuous functions, the modulus of continuity tends to 0. And therefore, this tends to 0. And, um, and the probability of red and the probability of black uh, are, are equal uh, in, the, in the limit uh, as, as h gets small. Uh, this is some useful reasoning. And um, it's natural to try to ask. Uh, how accurate it is, or how, you know, what if h isn't so small? How accurate is this? Uh, if you like calculus problems, you might try to prove this. Uh, the probability of red minus a half, I'll do it that way, um, is less than or equal to h over 8 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f prime of theta, d theta. Um, uh, you know, in order to prove any sort of theorem of this sort, uh, it, somebody could be very accurate in rolling, and this um, density could be very, very peaked over a certain point. So somehow or other, you need to say something about, uh, about how peaked the distribution is. And for people who like calculus problems, this 8 is sharp. Okay. Um, in the other direction, there was literature following up. Everything that Poincaré wrote about has follow-up literature. And Poincaré assumed continuity. And people said, well, you could do it with less. In fact, nowadays, it's easy to see that this theorem, this theorem is true for measurable functions. You don't need any assumptions because translation is continuous in L1, Okay, if you like that kind of argument. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 does, it does tend to 0. I, I like this kind of argument, which gives me some sort of rate. OK, so that method got abstracted. And uh, I'll tell you one or two sentences more about it. Um, let, me, let me see if I have, OK. I do have one. <laughs> Yeah, I do have a lot of things. Uh, um, uh, one image of randomness that we talk about all the time is this, p le fas. And uh, um, you know, why does coin tossing, which is a basic image of random phenomena, why is it random? And um, uh, Joe Keller wrote a very nice paper in which he said, listen, you know, when we flip a coin, if I knew how fast it was going up, and I knew how many times a second it was turning. Newton tells me whether it's going to come down, assuming it lands without bouncing, whether it's going to come down heads or tails. I know how long it stays up. I know how many times a second it's turning. I know what it's going to do. Right? So coin tossing is physics. It's not random. So you can do the physics. Uh, and, uh, I'll, I, I, and the handout, there's a, there's a picture I should explain. Well, I don't have one, but it's OK. I know what's on the handout. Um, <laughs> thank you, kind person. <laughs> um, uh, so first, this is uh, the picture from Poincaré's book. Uh, if you, if you want to see it, and you can see his version of the argument. This is the phase space of, I know this picture. This is the phase space of coin tossing. So let me just tell you what it's like. Um, uh, this is velocity how fast the coin is going up. And this is omega, how many times a second the coin is spinning. And so every time you flip a coin in this version, in which it's sort of just flipping around an axis through its center of gravity, um, uh, a, 
a, dot, a flip corresponds to a dot on this picture. How fast is the coin going up, and how many times a second is it turning? And uh, so, for example, uh, a dot here uh, means it's going up with a lot of velocity, but very little spin. So it's going up like a pizza. Yeah. So you can imagine that there's a region, and it's a, bounded by a hyperbola when you do it, where points below this region, the coin doesn't turn over at all. For example, out here, but also up here, um, the coin could be going with a tremendous amount of spin, but not very much velocity, so it doesn't turn over. And then there's a region, a next region, where it turns over just once, and then twice, et cetera. And, and the, the picture on the right is a, is a picture of that phase space. If you look at the picture, what you'll see is that as you move away from zero, the, um, the regions get closer together. And so intuitively, small changes in initial conditions make for the difference between heads and tails. And everybody knows that that's, um, that's where randomness comes from. Uh, I was interested in um, uh, when we really flip real coins, where are we on that nice picture? And so I did a lot of experiments over the years um, uh, in one of them, uh, we got a tunable strobe light and you know, painted half the coin black and half the coin white and flipped it and tried to adjust the strobe and figured out, you know, figured out where we are on this picture. And um, in the units of this picture, um, uh, well, one, two, three, four, five, uh, this in velocity, um, the velocity coins, the way you flip them normally, go up about five miles an hour. Uh, my units, uh, and, uh, and uh, in the units of this picture, the velocity is a fifth. Well, this is you know five, this is one, a fifth is pretty close to zero, but coin spin something like a 40 revolutions per second, and a typical coin flip takes about half a second, and so in the units of this picture, the velocity variable is 40 units up. So actually, the picture says nothing about real coin tossing. But the math behind the picture tells you how seriated this region is. And of course, if you want to know about heads and tails, what you have is a distribution of, of picks here. And if the regions get close, close together, about half of the area lies over heads and half over tails. And so one can make a version of Poincaré's argument, these kinds of arguments, for this kind of setup. And in the, if you wanted to learn more about that, uh, in fact, real coins do something more complicated. When you flip a real coin, in fact, they process. And the paper I reference with Susan Holmes and Richard Montgomery, we did the three-dimensional case. And so in three dimensions, it's actually, you know, in mechanics, it's 12 dimensions, right? It's, you know, it's 12 dimensions. And so you have some seriation of 12-dimensional space, and you want to know what, what, what portion of it lies over heads and what portion over tails. And there were versions of this theorem for, for, for that kind of situation. So that's Poincaré's roulette argument. It's um, often called nowadays the method of arbitrary functions, um, because Poincaré um, was interested in the fact that for an arbitrary probability density, if h is small enough, uh, you know, the chance of red is, is a half. And the same is true in, in, in these other settings. I said that there were things to do. And one of the things to do, which as far as I know hasn't been done, is to make the right abstraction of these theorems. That is, I just told you a couple of special cases. Yeah, you know, that one, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. What's the right setting? What's the right abstraction of that theorem? So you have a scale. I don't know, actually. So OK. Uh, how, how to, you know, nobody's, nobody's come back and done that. Um, if you're interested, Poincaré, at the end of his probability book, has all kinds of things he's talking about which relate to that. OK, so that's my first topic of what's in Poincaré, the method of arbitrary functions. Mm, uh, one more sentence. Uh, this method was brilliantly developed by Eberhard Hopf, who 
began a classification of, of low water differential equations. And if you have uncertainty about the initial conditions or the coefficients of them, how does that propagate into uncertainty? Uh, and Hopf, who I think called it method of arbitrary functions. Uh, and uh, if you want to see references to the literature, there's a section on it in the paper that I wrote with uh, Susan and Richard Montgomery. And for what it's worth, I put all my papers on my homepage. If you type Percy into Google, you'll find me, and if you spell it correctly. And, uh, and uh, so it's easy, easy to find. OK, so that's my first topic, uh, uh, Poincaré on the method of arbitrary functions. This was a very, very innovative idea. Um, what he was trying to establish was that um, there were certain situations in which the exact details of the probability distribution didn't matter. He had three examples in the book, and this is one of them. Um, the second example I'm going to talk about um, is a little less widely discussed, but I um, hope that'll change after this talk. Um, and so again, remember, my job is to try to bring what's in Poincaré alive to you. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you the way we think about it now, and then I'll tell you what he did, same way I just did. Um, so I call this subject, uh, well, Bayesian numerical analysis. And just to start, um, suppose I had a function uh, on 0, 1, say on 0, 1. I have a function f of x. And I'm going to tell you what it is. It's e to the uh, cosh of x squared plus cosine x plus x to the fifth uh, plus sinh x. OK, that's my function. And so there it is, my function. And now suppose I also had a water pistol. Pistol d'eau? How do you say water pistol in Francais? Thank you. And I have my water pistol, and I say, Cedric, what do you think the integral of that function is between 0 and 1? <laughs> and he says, and I go, Cedric? <laughs> so there's a question. What does it mean to know a function? Just seeing a formula for a function doesn't mean you know very much about it. You don't know about the maximum. You don't know about its integral. You don't know lots and lots of things about it. Well, one thing you could do, and we're going to do, is to own up to that fact and um, say, hey, you know, just seeing a formula, I know something. I don't really know all about the function. So um, let me try this. Uh, so since I don't know, I'll put quotes around no, the function, I'll own up to that fact. And I'll put a probability distribution, a, a, a prior distribution on functions. Now, I'm not a fancy French probabilist, so I only know one probability distribution on functions, Brownian motion. Uh, so say, I think, Or I assume for a moment that f of x uh, is, I don't know what it is exactly. I have this formula, some a plus b times uh, b of x, where b of x is Brownian motion. Okay. It's crazy, but bear with me for a second. Now suppose I observe the function at a few points. We see uh, yi equals f of xi, 1 less than or equal to i, less than or equal to n. So I observe the function at some points. So now by calculus, I have an a posteriori distribution. I assumed it was like Brownian motion. I see where it is at a few points. I have a new distribution, which is Brownian motion constrained to go through those points. Then you could ask the question, well, if that's correct, what's the optimal quadrature rule? What's the best guess at the integral with this information? Uh, so the best guess under squared error is lost. Uh, 
uh, at, uh, I'll call it uh, the integral of f of x dx is uh, f hat, uh, I'll call it i, I hat. And, uh, and, and what it is is the expected value, the average value of, of, uh, of the integral of, uh, of this b of x dx, given, uh, given what you're given, the conditional distribution. It's just Bayes' theorem in, in this setting. And what this is is the trapezoid rule, the trapezoid rule. That is, I have my function. Uh, I know it at some points. I connect the points up by straight lines, and I use the area under that straight line approximation, as that's what the, this calculation gives you. Uh, well, seeing a classically used rule, the trapezoid rule is very often used, comes out of this crazy set of assumptions makes me want to try to use this board properly. So, uh, ha. You might say, well, look, that function that you wrote down there, horrible as it may seem, it's nothing like Brownian motion. It's much smoother. Well, you might therefore say Brownian motion isn't the right prior. You could try some smoother prior. You might try, um, uh, say, f of x is distributed as the integral uh, from 0 to x of b of t dt or, or some, other, some other smoothing procedure. But let's take once integrated Brownian motion. That's a measure on the space of all functions. And um, if you use this prior and go through that calculation, you'll find that the Bayes estimate, the optimal estimate, is the cubic spline interpolant of your function. If you, if you um, integrate k times, you get 2k plus 1 ordered splines. So seeing standard numerical analysis procedures coming out of this crazy assumption maybe makes you want to think about them uh, a little bit more. You can ask, going backwards, is there some measure on the space of all continuous functions, say, which uh, gives you even order splines. We don't know. Open, open problem. Um, uh, let me ask. The fact that I was using the quadrature rule that I got out of an assumption as something, as, as, as some information about the quality of my prior assumption, leads to the math problem, is Brownian motion the only measure on functions which gives you the trapezoid rule? Well, the answer is no. Uh, so let me write it down as a question. Is Brownian motion the only uh, 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 measure uh, on functions giving the trapezoid rule. And the answer is no. Um, uh, any independent increments process, a Poisson process, gives you the same rule. Uh, any, the increments are, well, any independent increments gives the same. Um, but independent increments processes have jumps. And if you want to say I have a measure uh, not on functions, but on continuous functions, then that gets rid of that problem. Uh, the second issue is, is well, twice B of t. Uh, twice Brownian motion predicts the same way as Brownian motion. Uh, and there's nothing special about 2. 2 could be sigma. And, and sigma uh, could be random and independent of Brownian motion. Um, but there's a beautiful theorem of David Williams, um, which says that's it. 
That is, if you have a measure on continuous functions, which predicts in the same way as Brownian motion, that is, gives the trapezoid rule as its quadrature rule, then it is a rescaled version of Brownian motion. Uh, and uh, um, so that's an example of how little math problems come, come about. Now, nobody needs me or us to tell them how to integrate one-dimensional functions. But if you're integrating in higher dimensions, this idea of working with a priori distributions and, and seeing what their Bayes rules uh, gives is a very, very healthy way of, 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 of doing various tasks in numerical analysis. And so this little subject is called Bayesian numerical analysis by me. Um, now, who did it first? Well, this is a talk on Poincaré. So uh, I'll tell you what Poincaré did. Poincaré did it first, and more or less exactly in this way. So here's what Poincaré did. Um, he has a, a, a chapter in his book which is called Interpolation. And um, uh, what's he doing? Um, well, he says, uh, suppose you have, uh, have a function f of x on, say, 0, 1, or on r, on r, say. Um, and, um, uh, and I don't know it, don't know it. Um, but we observe it at some points. Observe yi is equal to f of xi, 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n. And um, uh, he wants to know how to, what's the best guess at the function at another point. Uh, so the best guess at f of some x star, some other point. Uh, and he says, um, I'm going to do this problem by the method of causes. The method of causes was 1900s language for Bayes' theorem. And he puts a prior distribution on functions by assuming that f of x had a power series expansion, um, i equals 0 to infinity of some coefficients. I'll call them ai times x to the i, where, um, according to Poincaré, uh, uh, ai was assumed to be Gaussian. Uh, independent from i to i, uh, normal with mean 0, say, and variance sigma i squared. So variances were, would fall uh, to 0. And then he says, well, if, if, if that's true, then this unknown function is itself a Gaussian variable. And uh, I'm, we're being told in linear functions of, Gaussian, of a Gaussian process, and we're being asked to calculate it, you know, its mean at another point. Nowadays, that's a standard problem. When Poincaré was working, there were no reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. He just does it anyway. And uh, he figures out what the Bayes rule is. Uh, and uh, um, I'll tell you what, what, he, what his estimate is. Um, uh, Poincaré. Uh, he made assumptions on sigma i squared falling off properly so that this exists for all. Poincaré um, looks at, um, uh, let me call it phi of x, which is the sum of um, uh, sigma i times x to the i, i equals 0 to infinity. This, this is a, an ordinary function. These are just the, the, the variances. Uh, and um, uh, says that um, f uh, hat at x, the best guess at, of f at, at a given point uh, is, uh, is given by the, the mean of the posterior, doing the same calculations I was doing. But he figures out what that is. Um, and it's uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n of epsilon i uh, phi of uh, x star times x i. This is phi. These are the x i's that you observed at. And epsilon i are parameters that are chosen so to, enforce, um, to enforce this, uh, 
this, this condition. So epsilon i, you have to solve a, a, a linear system. And he works, it, works out what this is in the case in which um, this phi is a polynomial, in which case he's getting polynomial interpolation. And uh, so that's quite, a, quite an original thing to have done in, uh, in 1890s. Uh, and it's an original thing now. Um, and if you haven't seen it before, it may seem strange, but it's all the rage in certain parts of, of, uh, of uh, numerical average case analysis of this type is being used in all kinds of high-powered computations. And I put one reference on the references, um, which is a survey article by Andy Stewart. Um, uh, and if you want to see you know, serious numerical analysts using this kind of Bayesian approach in order to solve very complicated problems. And this article is a wonderful um, place to start looking. But many, many serious numerical analysts are, are doing computations of, of this way, in, in this way. So that's my second example of, of, um, of Poincaré um, doing interesting things. And if you read that chapter, there are other parts of that chapter. And as far as I know, nobody's ever read that chapter. So, uh, um, no, he didn't. He, 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 he doesn't do any examples. Um, he does work out exactly what this is in the case of, uh, uh, of a certain choice of the sigma i's vanishing, but that's as far as he goes. Right. Um, so, right. And I wrote, a, the, I wrote a survey article a long time ago uh, called Bayesian Numerical Analysis, which traces other people who have, done, who have done this kind of thing. And you, you can do it for any task in numerical analysis. You can try this as, as a way to go. Um, OK, so that's a second, um, that's a second example. Uh, and so the, the last example I want to talk about is Poincaré's work on battage des cartes uh, and uh, shuffling cards. And um, so shuffling. And that was um, an, an example that Poincaré used in several articles for the public where he was trying to explain the onset of randomness and, and how things that start out not random could wind up being random. And, um, and I want to take you through a little bit of what he did and uh, didn't do. Uh, so so let, me, uh, let me start where he started. Um, in anything he wrote until the last edition, the second edition of his book, he said, well, it's too complicated to do even with three cards. Let's do it with two cards. <laughs> OK, well, bear with, bear with me for a second. Uh, so let me work with a deck which has n equals 2. And so there's two arrangements. The cards can be in order 1, 2, or they can be in the reverse order, 2, 1. And what we're going to do is to repeatedly mix them. And the mixing is we're either going to do nothing with probability p1, just this is the identity permutation, or we're going to switch the two cards with probability p2. And of course, p1 plus p2 is equal to 1. And Poincaré says, let's consider the following bet. Um, we're going to shuffle k times. And um, if if the cards are in their original order, one, two, you get a dollar, Frank. And if they're in the reverse order, you have to pay me a dollar, OK, or Cedric. And, um, and so let's think about that. So uh, uh, shuffle k times. Uh, if after k shuffles, it's in one, two, you, you get you get, say, one unit. Uh, if it's 2, 1, you give one unit. OK? So let's do a few calculations, little baby calculations. Suppose you shuffle once. If k is 1, um, what can happen? Well, if you don't shuffle and the cards are in the original order, you get the dollar. If you happen to switch them, then the cards are out of order, and you lose the unit. And so the average value. Uh, is p1 minus p2, right? If, if 
if you happen to leave them alone, you get a unit. If you switch them once, you lose a unit. Let's take k equals 2 now. You shuffle twice. We have to, what's the average, the average payoff? Well, if, if, so you've done two shuffles. You might do nothing twice. Uh, the average um, is p1 squared. Or you might switch them and then switch them again. In that case, you also get a dollar, p2 squared. But you might not do anything and switch them, or switch them and not do anything. In both of those cases, you lose a unit. So minus 2, p1, p2. That's the average payoff to you. And of course, this is p1 minus p2 squared. And for general k, uh, the average uh, is easy to show, is p1 minus p2 to the kth power. And, and Poincaré says you can see that that goes to 0 so that the game is fair if you shuffle a lot, if k is large. And so that's, that's Poincaré trying to get people to understand that if you shuffle a lot, um, you mix it up. You mix up the, the, the cards. OK. Um, Oh. This beautiful math has to go, but it will. <laughs> Poincaré must have felt a little guilty for having written four or five times uh, the case of general K is too hard. And so in the second edition of his book, which was completed in the last year of his life, he adds a section, and it's quite a long section, maybe 15 or 20 pages in that, of that length, in which he analyzes the problem of shuffling cards for general deck sizes. And I want to at least tell you a little bit about, about where he got to and, and how he did it, uh, the kind of math that, that he used in order to solve this problem. Um, so he treats the problem. So for general deck sizes, um, he says, well, there are the different ways of arranging a deck of cards. And let's label them sigma 1, sigma 2, the different orders, sigma n factorial, all the different possible arrangements. And our shuffling scheme will be starting at the cards all in order, starting at the identity. I'll have a certain probability distribution over the allowable permutations. So we work with uh, repeated shuffles. Uh, I'll call it pi is the probability of sigma i. Some, some way of shuffling. And, um, and he says, in order to, to work with this problem, I need to use some algebra. And this is you know, 1912. Uh, and, but still, so he doesn't quite have the language, but, or he didn't care about the language. Uh, so he works in what we now would call the group algebra. Uh, Um, which is, um, he calls it uh, uh, generalized complex numbers, um, but uh, which is the set of all linear combinations of permutations, I equals 1 to n factorial. So my probability assignment I can associate to an element of, you know, and it might only be, it might be that pi is, is 1 for a transposition in, it's a half for a transposition and a half for an n cycle, and it's zero for all the other cases. So pi is some probability distribution on, uh, on, uh, on these uh, guys. And um, uh, he understands, he shows, that if you square this element, uh, uh, so if, uh, uh, probability of sigma after two shuffles, after two shuffles, 
Um, well, of course, it's equal to the probability of uh, sigma i times the probability of sigma times sigma i inverse uh, over all i. The chance of winding up at sigma after two shuffles, you had to have done something your first shuffle and then chosen the permutation that gets you to sigma after your second shuffle is the coefficient of sigma uh, in uh, p squared. So if you take this element in the group algebra and square it and look at the coefficient of sigma, that's the chance of sigma after two shuffles, and so on. Um, uh, and he says what we want to prove, uh, and he says theorem, uh, under assumptions that I'll make specific in a second, uh, p to the kth power, if you shuffle k times, uh, uh, this tends to 1 over n factorial times the sum over all sigma. Uh, so, uh, and that says that if you shuffle the cards a lot, they get all mixed up. I mean, all arrangements become equally likely. That's what he wants to prove. Now, that theorem, the way I've just said it, isn't, isn't true because your shuffling could be you just switch the top two cards and that's it. Well, you're not going to mix them up. See, so there need to be some assumptions. <laughs> The method that Poincaré uses to prove this theorem is methods that Frobenius and Cartan had uh, derived about algebras. Um, uh, and um, uh, so uh, Poincaré uses um, uh, the, the, the following the idea of the characteristic vector or eigenvalue, um, uh, idea uh, that, uh, so P is an element of the group algebra, X is another element of the group algebra, and Cartan had shown that, that we, nowadays we understand, that there are eigenvectors in algebras, and this is an eigenvalue, and this is the eigenvector. So he's going to use these ideas, and he proves proves that um, uh, that this convergence holds um, if and only if the support of pi is not uh, in a coset of a subgroup. So you need the way that you're shuffling to be able to get to all possible arrangements, and you need to avoid parity problems, and he's aware of that. And, uh, and in these cases, uh, he shows that any eigenvalue uh, is less than or equal to 1, and that the, the vector, this element, of the group algebra is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. He, he knows that. And he proves that all of the, under this assumption, that all of the other eigenvalues are strictly less than 1. And he therefore concludes that this converges to, to that. He's aware and has to deal with the fact that um, this operator, this element p, uh, might not be diagonalizable. So you need something like uh, you know, the Jordan form of an operator. And, and he worries about that and, and, does, and deals with it and does manage to prove this theorem. And uh, uh, it's, it's quite an elaborate argument with a lot of details in it. And uh, obviously, somebody was bugging him about it. Maybe he was bugging himself about it. But for Poincaré, there's an awful lot of detail there. Um, some things he doesn't do. Um, uh, uh, doesn't, uh, one is uh, mentioned Markov. <laughs> That's not <laughs> so surprising. Uh, but Markov, 1906 at any rate, had developed the theory of Markov chains. And if you want an interesting answer to a good question, ask me when, during questions, why did Markov develop Markov chains? It's an interesting story. Markov developed Markov chains for some interesting reason. And he had two examples, one of which was rhyming patterns in Eugene O'Negan. And he went blind 
gathering the data, actually. And the second was shuffling cards. And so Markov has an elaborate uh, description of shuffling cards and a much more general setup. Uh, Poincaré's argument really uses the fact that he's in the group algebra, and it, it wouldn't work for, for, for more general Markov chains. The second thing he doesn't do is anything quantitative, um, uh, anything quantitative. And let me just tell you two quantitative uh, results so you can see what I mean. There's the usual way that people shuffle cards. You have a deck of cards. You cut them about in half, and you go like that. You ripple shuffle them together. And Dave Beyer and I um, uh, showed uh, that 3 halves uh, log to the base 2 of n uh, uh, plus c uh, get you e to the minus c close. Um, so if, if k. And so this is says, you know, about seven shuffles uh, required to mix up 52 cards. If you riffle shuffle, on the other hand, um, if you do the other method of shuffling, you know, this method of shuffling, you know what I mean by that? You have a deck of cards, you clump, 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 clump. It's n squared log n uh, versus uh, n squared log n uh, for overhand shuffling. Um, and um, uh, so when n is 52, n squared is 2,500, log 52 is about 5, 4 and a half. So it's 10,000. Okay? So it takes 10,000 of these versus 7 of the others. Right? So there's an interesting world of, um, of quantitative uh, theory. Um, Poincaré was interested in the fact that for any method of shuffling, as long as it wasn't stupid, uh, you would converge at infinity, and that's what, that's what he was set out to do and what he did. Um, and uh, I see Tempest Fugit. Um, so um, I, won't, I, won't, uh, I won't say more about shuffling. Uh, I promise you I could. Uh, uh, the last thing to say is something for all of this, but in particular for me, um, the math problems that I'm working on right now or trying to understand what I call schmushing cards. That is, that's this method of shuffling. You know what I mean? People put cards on the table and go like that, right? And how long does it take to schmush? And, you know, to, right? and I'm not going to give a talk about that, but the way I'm doing it is using fluid dynamics, treating the, treating the cards as a fluid. And, uh, and if you look at the last 30 pages of Poincaré's appendix, the last chapter, it's all about mixing in fluids. And there's just an awful lot of math. As far as I know, nobody's ever looked at that. I'm looking at it pretty hard. He doesn't get very far, but he, you know, he's Poincaré, and he, he gets someplace. Um, what I tried to tell you in this talk is that, um, first of all, there's a lot of life in Poincaré. And, uh, and the second thing is that, there's still gold in them, their hills. Uh, it's worth picking them up in any area and trying to read them. Thank you. OK. Any questions? Questions, comments? Yes, here. Microphone, please. You have to, that we have to get a microphone. It's coming. <laughs> oh, hello again, Percy. Uh, do you, uh, are your prim preliminary results show that smooshing is a little between uh, uh, riffle sh uh, shuffling mm -hmm. and um, basic shuffling? It, it, the preliminary results show that it's an amazingly um, uh, fast way of mixing. Just to say, the first thing I did was get some data. <laughs> so I, I got some undergraduate and uh, had her um, smush cards for a minute and then record the permutation and do that 100 times. So I had 100 permutations. Now, if if you didn't schmush enough, why wouldn't they be random? Well, you might think there were too many cards which were originally together that are still together. For example, we found we made 10 test statistics of that sort. Schmushing for a minute passed all tests. Schmushing for half a minute passed all tests. 
15 seconds started to detect. It's a pretty efficient, I was surprised. It's a pretty efficient way of doing it. It's a standard way of shuffling in Monte Carlo. It's not just me who's interested. You might be interested too. It's the standard way they shuffle in poker tournaments. So it's not, you know, okay. okay. So it seems to be more effective than, than I think, and we have some preliminary results, but there's a, there are miles to go. So I first have a comment and then a question. My comment is that all to the credit of Poincaré, he had an added disadvantage that in France we have this beautiful card game called Belote where we don't actually shuffle. So he actually did that without actually working with shuffling so much. And I have a question. Uh, why did Markov invent Markov chains? <laughs> what a good question. <laughs> Where did you find this question? <laughs> uh, I will answer that because it's a nice story. Um, uh, so around the turn of the century, but actually it lasted quite a long time uh, in the Soviet Union, a kind of mathematical Lysenkoism took over the mathematical community. It, was, it had a religious overtones. It was uh, one of the th main themes of it was free will. And um, the Russian analysts in the cities to which this was going on were sort of instructed to not work on smooth functions because they didn't have enough free will. But that's somehow where the Soviet school of, 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 uh, of um, more general functions uh, arose. You may think, this is crazy. Nobody can tell us what to work on. If they break your windows, you know, beat you up, um, uh, you know, fire you from your job, and it all happened, uh, all of a sudden, you know, it's a problem. So there were some crazy people who were espousing this free will. There's an interesting book about it. Um, there was a czar of probability, and he was called Necrosoft, like Microsoft, but... Hmm. And he declared that the only things that were fit to work on for probabilists were sums of independent random variables, because only they had enough free will in order to, so that the basic laws of probability would hold. Markov couldn't stand this story, and he invented Markov chains as a political statement. Markov chains are dependent, and he proved the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem for Markov chains. And the last line of his paper is, thus, free will is not necessary to do probability. So they were invented as a political example, not because you know, it's, it's a wonderful story. Right? And uh, there's a there's beautiful article about it by Eugene Sinita. And uh, um, anyway, <laughs> okay. Question there Hi. in the bottom. Who the wait, wait, wait for the microphone, please. Uh, I may be wrong, but I, I thought that Poincaré's book was a textbook, actually, and it was part of lectures. I was wondering why he was asked to give a lecture about probability, and if there is anything known about the reaction to his course, and who the students were, if, and if they did something with it. Right. So I meant to say this at the beginning, and if those of you who have my handout, had I done it, I should have... I would have written it down, but there's a very, very nice survey article about Poincaré and randomness uh, uh, by uh, uh, M-A-Z-L-I-A-K. Uh, and it was given just recently. Uh, Laurent, Laurent Maziak. Thank you. Uh, good. And, and uh, he traces very carefully the, the answer to that question. I'll give it briefly. Um, uh, Poincaré um, didn't have a, a fancy job. Uh, a chair of probability in physics came open, and he that was the job he wanted. It was at the Sorbonne. And his first couple of years, he didn't teach any probability whatsoever. Um, during that time, he was teaching thermodynamics, and he got involved in controversies with the English school. Uh, Poincaré, Poincaré, I'll say, wasn't a believer in, it's complicated, who knows what he believed in, but Poincaré wasn't a believer in statistical mechanics, uh, which many people didn't believe in before the turn of the century. After all, Boltzmann killed himself. Uh, um, uh, and he, in the middle of that controversy, he decided, maybe I better figure out about probability. And he started to give these lectures. They were first you know, written down uh, in, in longhand, and then they were used as um, used as a textbook. And so, I think the main 
the main uh, people who read it were students, but it did become the standard textbook in probability for about 15 or 20 years uh, following a book by his advisor, Bertrand. And uh, uh, it, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I don't quite know. It's not so easy to read Poincaré, although this is pretty friendly as, as, as those things go. Um, I was told by somebody in this room that uh, Poincaré was a criminally bad lecturer, and uh, so maybe they read the book very carefully. Uh, but uh, a thing I find interesting, I'd like an answer from you after this uh, is over, the probability that Poincaré put in his book is the kind of thing I was talking about here. They're concrete, real-world problems, what we would nowadays call applied probability. Given that he was the major force in mathematics, the major probabilist of his time, how did French probability, wonderful, healthy French probability, not knocking it at all, how did it go in such an opposite direction of, of what Poincaré uh, set out to do? I really don't understand that. It's just a completely different subject. And uh, it's an interesting question to me how that happened. Uh, okay, it's good. Here a question. Well, it's not a question. It's almost one word, and that is Dreyfus. Yes. That he it figures very prominently towards the end of the process of acquitting Dreyfus. So Poincaré was involved in the Dreyfus uh, scandal and uh, did, um, did write a position paper making uh, terrible fun, deserved fun of Bert, Bert, not Bertillon, uh, the, the fingerprint guy. Not the fingerprint guy, the, anyway. The, and uh, if you look at the document that there is, that is left of that, um, it's a very sketchy document. It's three or four pages, and they, I, I wasn't so impressed by Poincaré's work on that case. Now, he might have done a lot of work in private or something like that, and he did very forcefully uh, uh, defend Dreyfus, uh, but, but I, yeah. anyway, it, it, it was real applied probability, and he certainly did, did, did work at that. Uh, so I... I I don't know, but I, I read the document, uh, Poincaré's, do it's on the web if you just type in Poincaré and Dreyfus, you, you find it, and it, it was pretty sketchy, and it just, it was a lot of name calling and, and rhetoric. Uh, was, there were a few calculations, but it didn't seem like, like he, he, he decided, I think, to try to argue from on, on high. That's uh, the way it looked like to me. <laughs> there is, pr from what I understood, there is a longer unpublished document that is still uh, at the ah. in the family Poincaré ah. about this uh, problem in which he computed probabilities, did study a lot, ah. the written, the handwriting, and Great. so on. So that would be something that one would have to look at. He does have some numbers, so it wasn't just you know a quick hatchet job, uh, but but it it didn't yeah it didn't I, I wasn't I wasn't I, I was expecting a more thorough <laughs> investigation given what a big deal it was. I mean uh, it was a big deal. Other question? Okay, I have one. Uh, Percy, could you? I didn't follow when you were explaining about the uh, difference between the two kinds of shuffling, overhand and the other. What, what are the two different ones? Okay, so the riffle shuffle, I meant to bring cards, I didn't. <laughs> the riffle shuffle is you have a deck of cards, you cut it about in half according to the binomial distribution, you start dropping the cards with your thumbs according to a rule, for example, if you have A cards here and B cards here, the chance that you drop your next card from here is A over A plus B. So you drop cards probability proportional to packet size and they riffle together, okay? That's one shuffle and then you can ask how many repetitions of that shuffle does it take to get you, you know, with an epsilon close to random in some metric on probabilities. And I could say, say it as carefully as you want, but in order to get e to the minus c close, you have to do this many shuffles. The second way of shuffling, <laughs> I won't do it, but, you know, was, I, I can't, but, you know, if you went like this, you kind of took random packets. Oh. Right, you know, they do that in casinos. Uh, yes. They they do strip shuffling, but we with cards. Here's a face down deck of cards. Here's that you clump, 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 and so a mathematical model for that is, in between each pair of cards, you put a coin with probability theta, say a half, and then you drop off all the, until the first head and all until the second head, and so you drop little packets. And in that model, uh, it's a theorem of Robin P. Mantles that it takes uh, uh, n squared log n 
repetitions. And that, is that, that so? Uh, uh, another question on mm -hmm. the first part of the talk. You, you talked about uh, guessing the integral for, uh, for a random function. And I almost like worried you, right? An approximation. <laughs> yes, you, you, you threatened me. And uh, you didn't talk about uh, rates of uh, convergence, about uh, uh, how typically what is the rate of approximation of right. things like this. I, di I didn't, uh, but, but people do. Um, in fact, um, uh, um, Hausdorff and, uh, and, uh, and Bonach wrote about that kind of thing. And you can find an appendix by Hausdorff in Bonach's book about putting measures on L1 and rates of convergence. There has been some work, but by and large, this was something that Poincaré did that I noticed in the 1980s was an interesting subject. A few students developed it, but then it went away again. And now it's come back with a vengeance in, in numerical analysis. So I think there's an awful lot to do there. And, and that, that, so there's a lot of nice things to do, and they haven't been done, I, I think. So it's a good question, but something to do <laughs> for all of us. Okay, let's uh, thank Percy again, and then I'll make a few announcements. So thank you again, Percy. <laughs> so first, Percy, as all the lecturer gets a Poincaré medal. This is oh. your medal, Percy. Oh. For those of the lecturers who don't uh, didn't get it, just uh, uh, just come to see me. I will I will give you. On one side there is Poincaré, on the other some representation of some of the Poincaré uh, great uh, actions, great deeds. There we have Poincaré medals. We have Galois medals that we can provide for those who want them. Uh, of course, if you didn't lecture, you need to pay a bit for the medal. That's how life goes. <laughs> now. Uh, about uh, Poincaré, about Galois, so last uh, year we celebrated Galois, this was the 200th anniversary of, of, uh, of his birth, now this year is the 100th anniversary of Poincaré. We are trying each year to organize some commemoration or celebration that has some wide interest, like this one. It's great that uh, we can see here there's a lot of people. We would like to have more young people in this kind of, uh, of uh, organization and so on. Please advertise for young people to participate in these kind of meetings that are not so specialized, I think. We think at Institut Poincaré, and many of us, I think, think too, that it is very important to open your mind to be exposed not only to the talks in your particular specialty. Now, all the talks in this uh, conference will be available, will uh, have been recorded and will be available some, at some point, not far from now, on our web page. Okay. Next uh, year, probably, we'll, there are two natural <coughs> things to celebrate. One thing is 2013 is the Mathematics for Planet Earth year, in which all around the world, Mathematics Institute will be hosting and discussing about things relating mathematics to the Earth, either environment or human populations or astronomy, many things like this. We'll have two of our trimesters will be devoted to these kind of things, one about ecosystems, and there will be one about astronomy. And uh, 2013 will also be the 200th anniversary of the death of Lagrange. So, of course, there will be something about Lagrange. As you know, Lagrange is claimed both by French and by Italian people. And uh, if you go to Turin, you can see the house where Lagrange was born. You can uh, see the statue of Lagrange and so on. Uh, so we'll definitely celebrate Lagrange. And the uh, last thing I will advertise for is that tomorrow is the end of this uh, week. So we started uh, last Saturday with the broad audience uh, celebration at Sorbonne for young people, for general audience, and so on. Next was the, the conference for mathematicians that was uh, concluded by the beautiful talk of Percy. And tomorrow, there will be the Poincaré seminar with Olivier Darigol, Alain Chanciner. Uh, today, this was the two-card problem. Tomorrow, it will be the three-body, <laughs> and so on. There will be Laurent Maziac. There will be François Béguin. It will be concluded by a movie by Philippe Worms, made for all kinds of, 
of audience. And uh, this is also the opportunity to advertise for the Poincaré Seminar, which uh, has been doing a great job for years now to produce thematic uh, days that are also intended for broad audience, for young people. This is a great way to get hold on some subject. I encourage you to participate in the one of tomorrow if you are available. That's all. Thank you very much for coming. And we are always happy to host you in Institut Poincaré. Thank you. Thank you.